Would Paul Dacre be a good choice to be the chairman of Ofcom? Uh, Steve Baker told me earlier he would be delighted to see that because he's a Conservative. Well, I think everyone's getting a little bit ahead of themselves with this. We will be launching shortly the process for the appointment of both the chairman of the BBC and uh, the Ofcom chair. And at that point, applicants will be welcome to, to apply for it. OK, so we're getting a bit ahead of ourselves, um, but the story's been clearly briefed to the Sunday newspapers. Uh, number 10 have decided to put the Culture Secretary forward for media interviews, suggests that somebody wants you to talk about it. Um, Paul Dacre and Charles Moore seem to be the Prime Minister's choices. Are they your first choice too? Well, I think let's, let's separate them out. They're, they're two very different appointments. First of all, in respect of the chair of the BBC, what we're looking for is a strong, big person who can uh, hold the BBC to account. And there's three things that I've been talking about with the BBC. First of all, ensuring there's genuine impartiality. Secondly, ensuring the BBC is up to the challenges of the future as we move from analogue through digital to platform technology. Huge changes for the BBC. And then thirdly, ensuring that the BBC represents all parts of our nation, not just uh, narrow metropolitan areas, the London, centre of London, Bristol, uh, Birmingham and so on. All so do you parts think that's the what United the BBC Kingdom. is doing now then? Well, I think uh, they're, they're working uh, towards it, and I think uh, Tim Davey has made uh, good progress with it. But it is important that we have a genuine, robust scrutiny of, of the BBC and looking forward to driving that agenda. OK. Paul Dacre once said that BBC journalism is reflected through a left-wing prism that affects everything it exercises as a kind of cultural Marxism. Do you agree with him? Well, I'm not going to get drawn into conversations about each of the candidates. Clearly, there's strengths to, to both uh, Charles Moore and to Paul Dacre. Uh, I've set out what I'd be looking for in respect of the BBC. We'll launch that process. We'll conduct it in accordance with the Charter. Similarly, in relation to Ofcom, Ofcom is an en enormously important economic regulator, covering everything through uh, mobile broadcasting uh, through to online harms. We need strong, credible people to, to fill those roles, and that's what we're looking for through the competition process. So if you don't want to be drawn on the candidates, are you a bit irritated that the Prime Minister seems to have jumped the gun? Well, look, there's, there's always going to be speculation about different candidates. We have a clear process for running this. We've been clear about what we're looking for. I'll be launching the competition for the BBC and for Ofcom shortly, and we'll be conducting that in the proper way. Has the Prime Minister consulted you about the appointments? Well, you would expect that the Prime Minister and I discuss these things uh, a great deal. These are hugely important roles, both the chair of the BBC and the chair of Ofcom. And, of course, we've, we've been in touch with each other a lot about it. OK. Um, now, Paul Dacre also predicted in 2018 that a right-of-centre TV network will one day take root in this country. Now, a new channel, GB News, has been announced with uh, Andrew Neil, the former BBC presenter, as the chairman. Do you welcome the idea of a newcomer and do you think there's a gap in the market? Definitely. I think one of the huge strengths of uh, the United Kingdom's broadcasting scene and indeed its uh, newspaper scene is a tremendous plurality and diversity. We often take this for granted, but we're so lucky in the UK to have, for example, with newspapers a range from, uh, you know, The Guardian right through The Telegraph, Mail. No other country in the world has that kind of diversity. And it is at the absolute heart of our freedoms in this nation, our, our press freedom. Similarly, with broadcasting, we're blessed with brilliant broadcasters, whether it's you here with Sky News, BBC, many other uh, different ranges of, of channels, and I welcome any new entrance to it. A bit of flattery there never, never does any harm, certainly. Um, is it time for Ofcom, though, to have uh, greater powers to regulate online uh, companies? Well, yeah, we've, we have indicated that for online harms, uh, our preferred regulator would be Ofcom. I'll shortly be publishing the response to the online harms white paper, the full response from the government, where we'll make a, a formal announcement about that. And this is a very important area of government policy. At a time when uh, we've all seen how reliant we are on online, uh, particularly during the COVID crisis, we need to ensure that we drive growth and prosperity through the digital revolution, but also we're able to protect the most vulnerable. And that's what that legislation will be about, getting that balance right and empowering an appropriate regulator to, to do so. And as I've said, Ofcom, is, uh, we've indicated, is our preferred regulator and will formally make that decision shortly. OK, uh, now I'm keen to move on to uh, other matters 
coronavirus, of course. Um, when I spoke to Steve Baker a bit earlier uh, on the programme, he was talking about his concerns about the restrictions imposed by the government. He said to me, liberty dies like this, with government exercising draconian powers without parliamentary scrutiny. Is liberty at risk of dying because of the government's response to COVID-19? Well, look, I have huge respect for Steve Baker. I, I like him enormously, but I think that is slightly overblown. Uh, we're, actually, it is important that Parliament holds the government to account. And that's why, for example, next week we'll be having the first debate on government time on COVID. Of course, there'll be a, risk, a chance for MPs to debate and vote on uh, new measures through what we call statutory instruments. There'll be votes on that, for example, in relation to the rule of six. It's entirely should appropriate. Should MPs be able to vote beforehand? I think there's quite an important distinction, isn't there, between retrospective voting and being able to vote before things are enacted? Well, I think it's important in a crisis like this, when things are moving very rapidly, that the government has the power to move quickly. And that is the power that the government was given through the initial legislation earlier this year. Uh, but then it's then important that MPs hold us to account and uh, vote on that. And that is exactly what's happening here. And, and I'm, I'm very clear, these are very difficult choices we're making. Uh, we have a rapidly uh, expanding virus. We also have huge economic consequences from the decisions that we're taking. And we are having to take measures to deal with that. It's entirely right that uh, government ministers are properly scrutinised by Parliament through this process. OK. Um, it sounds like you think that the current system is, is uh, working uh, all right then. Now, uh, I want to talk about local lockdowns. Uh, millions of people in local lockdowns already. Sadiq Khan, the Mayor of London, says now it's time for greater restrictions on people in the capital not being able to visit people's households because of the rising infection levels. Is the government preparing to introduce tougher restrictions on London? Well, look, in response to the rising number of uh, COVID cases, we announced the measures over the past couple of weeks, principally the, the rule of six and then the further restrictions in the past week. Of course, we keep all these things under review. But the key thing now is that people stick to the existing rules that we have. They observe the rule of six, hands, face and space. They, people wash their hands. Um, make sure they wear face coverings, particularly uh, indoors, and observe social distancing. If we do all of those things, we can keep the virus under control and keep our economy open and avoid further restrictions. It really is uh, in the power of everyone watching this show to make sure they abide by those rules and prevent further more draconian restrictions. It's interesting you're really putting uh, you know, the blame squarely uh, on people and, and to be fair you know the study by King's College London only 18 percent of people with reported COVID-19 symptoms went on to self-isolate at the same time though you know the government was the ones telling us all to kind of eat out to help out telling us that we needed to do a bit to get the economy moving and now you're saying oh no not that much it's your fault now because of rising infections you can see why people might be feeling a bit aggrieved uh, well Sophie I think that's a rather unfair characterization of, of what I just said uh, the the majority of people up and down the country are abiding by the rules, but I think they are frustrated at a small minority who are not law abiding, who are putting other people's health at risk. That is why, for example, we've doubled uh, the fine for not observing the rules in relation to face coverings and so on. That's why we've uh, said that it'll be up to £10,000 worth of fines if people don't observe social isolation. because. No man is an island in, in this. Every, each person has to take their own responsibilities uh, because it will in turn affect everyone else. And the government is taking its responsibility, uh, both in terms of ensuring the correct rules are in place, but also, for example, by ensuring massive amounts of PPE equipment, a huge upsurge in uh, testing capacity. We all need to work together to defeat this terrible virus. And um, some uh, minority people then behaving selfishly? The, there is a small minority, and that is why we've um, announced more uh, stringent uh, rest, uh, fines okay. in respect of them. Um, I do feel as well um, we need to talk a bit about young people and university students. You know, going to university always a quite stressful time in your life, often away from home for the first time. Freshers' week cancelled, tutorials online, many self-isolating, and now suddenly many also told they can't even go home. Uh, at Christmas to see their families. Um, should university students be allowed to go home in the holidays? Well, of course, I very much uh, want students to be able to go home at Christmas. And if we all pull together and observe these 
uh, new rules, uh, we follow the guidance, then we will be able to get to a point where that should be possible. But I have to say to you, Sophie, that Labour raising this, um, it all fits a bit with what I heard from the Shadow Education Secretary a couple of days ago, saying not let a good crisis go to waste. There's no difference between us. We both want to ensure that uh, students can return at Christmas. And rather than sort of playing politics with this, I'd rather Labour was urging everyone to work together to achieve this outcome. At the same time, though, you know, you're in no way saying that it is certain that university students will be able to go home at Christmas. So saying that's only a possible if, you know, everyone does the right thing and manages to get the virus under control. That's going to be quite concerning for people. Well, we're three months away from uh, Christmas. Uh, we've announced a, a range of measures. We are constantly keeping this situation under review, taking the necessary measures to keep the virus under control. Uh, all of that is designed to ensure that we keep the virus under control in a way that will enable people to continue to, to live their lives normally and uh, or as normally as possible in, in this situation. So of course we want to avoid that, that situation, but I don't think it's helpful at this stage, three months away, to speculate on that. The thing we should be focusing on now is ensuring that we actually uh, take these measures and uh, abide by them. Uh, OK. Um, now, I want to ask you a little bit about football and, and live sports, um, because, of course, uh, many people were very excited about the idea of live crowds uh, being allowed back. And for many smaller clubs and teams as well, they're relying uh, on ticket sales to actually keep afloat. Um, it's very difficult, uh, particularly for, you know, for example, small football clubs. Merthyr Town FC have already been mothballed, for example. What exactly are you going to do about this? Well, look, nobody could be more disappointed than me that we weren't able to go ahead with uh, fans going back into stadiums socially distanced from the 1st of October. But I think most people would agree against this backdrop of rapidly rising cases, now was not the time to do it. In terms of our response now, uh, we have said we stand ready to support uh, clubs. They're such an important part of our local community and they were there at the height of the crisis. They had our back and now it's time for the government to have their back. But the first thing we need to look to is the Premier League. I've been uh, in contact with the Premier League uh, over the course of this week. We're all agreed that the Premier League needs to step up to the plate and they're having uh, intensive discussions with the EFL about how they can support those clubs. So they stand ready to play their part and the Prime Minister and I have been clear in urging them to do that. Uh, beyond that, we are working across all sports because remember it's not just uh, football to see what support uh, they need uh, after the decision in relation to the 1st of October. Uh, we've engaged with them and I've actually asked for them all to provide formal returns by Wednesday of exactly their, their situation. And we are looking at a range of measures that we could uh, introduce in order to help and support them through this difficult time. You mentioned there about the Premier League um, trying to step in. Um, and of course, big clubs are the ones who are most financially able to survive this difficult period. It's much smaller clubs uh, that are more likely to really uh, be reliant uh, on those live crowds. So what's your assessment then? Are, are the Premier League preparing something? Well, uh, the, the Premier League and the EFL are in intense discussions. I believe uh, there's a meeting taking place on Tuesday of, of the Premier League. The direction is clear. We understand that uh, Premier League needs to play its part. I'm in close consultation with them and I'm hopeful that they will be able to reach a deal to provide that, that level of, of support. And just finally, are we likely to see crowns at football matches before the end of the season? Well, of course, I, I desperately love that to happen. Um, and we keep the situation under constant review. But not only that, we are continuing to, to work ahead, uh, investigating the use of uh, new technology, working with the clubs who've done such a fantastic job up to now. If it is at all possible, of course, I'd like that to happen. But uh, I think you and your viewers will appreciate that in this rapidly moving situation with the virus, we just need to exercise a little bit of caution, which is what we have, have done in relation to the 1st of October.